almighty God, in whose name we gather and whose love we acknowledge. Be with us this afternoon as we listen to your voice in the sounds and sights of friendship and wisdom. Make us ever attentive to your presence, especially in your poor and your prophets, you who live forever and ever. Stop. Please sit down. As Chancellor of St. John's University, in the name of the sponsoring Benedictine community, and in the name of the Board of Regents, I herewith call into session this commencement convocation at the conclusion of our 129th year for the conferring of the academic degrees granted by the university. I request Father Hilary Timish, President of the University, to take charge of these exercises. I'm going to skip my usual uh, pleasantries and attempts at witticism in the interest of brevity and uh, simply take the occasion at the beginning to congratulate the graduates, to welcome their parents and relatives and friends, the members of our Board of Regents who are here, and say a heartfelt thanks to the members of the faculty and of the staff of St. John's University who have, again, this year, given such an example of their dedicated work. There is one uh, addition to the program. At the uh, last moment, an alumnus of St. John's uh, went to the North Pole. And when he came back, we thought it would be nice to congratulate him at, in the midst of our commencement ceremonies. So we've invited Paul Shirky here today to receive a president's citation. More of that later in the program. To start with, we have our senior speaker, Frederick Stein, who is a government major who grew up in the Chicago area. He's the son of Mr. and Mrs. William Stein of Oak Park, Illinois. He's one of six children. He has established an excellent academic record and has been very active on campus, having been at various times a football player, a member of the crew, a disc jockey at KSJU, secretary of AKS, officer of the government club, student representative on one of the regents' committees, chairman of the Student Services Committee of the St. John Senate. There have probably been other activities that I'm not aware of. Uh, Fred plans to attend law school probably at Boston College. I'm happy to present him to speak on behalf of the graduating class. Father Hillary, I also am glad that your intelligence, intelligence network isn't too thorough. Uh, <laughs> other activities, that was, that was a good way to put it. Uh, my roommate told me to pretend that I was just up here today talking in front of my public speaking class, and then I wouldn't feel nervous. Simply stated, Pat, your uh, theory stinks. <laughs> Well, graduates, I'm uh, glad to see that all of you can make it today. I have noticed a few uh, tired faces and 
baggy eyes and yawns out there, myself included, probably due to all the intense studying we've been going through the last couple of days. Uh, but I'm very proud, very excited, very nervous to uh, represent the class of 1986. I'm not especially sure why I was chosen. I, I know it wasn't because of my GPA, as Steve probably will attest to. I think that uh, Guy Hummel just nominated me so he could watch me squirm up here. The truth is, I have been just a little bit paranoid lately about speaking, put it off to the last minute. And uh, just as a matter of fact, this morning I was here at Mass sitting over in the choir stalls, and during the gospel there was a baby in front of me that just stared at me the whole time. I could swear she was just laughing at me, just thinking <laughs> she knew I wasn't ready and I knew it. <laughs> you know. As a matter of fact, if the speech were for class, I'd probably be asking Father Hilly for an extension right now. <laughs> but uh, seeing that that's out of the question, and being a senior, I'm just decided to take this speech pass fail. <laughs> Many people warned me not to be too serious or too sentimental up here. Jerry Keating actually threatened me with physical violence. <laughs> but uh, it's hard not to be just a little sentimental when you're leaving an institution where you spent possibly the four most important years of your life. St. John's is a special place, and don't let anybody kid you about it. A lot of people joke about being trapped behind the pine curtain, but that might be exactly what makes St. John's so unique. Collegeville's isolation helps to make St. John's different from any institution most of us will ever know. The atmosphere has helped to transform us not into just a class, but into a community. A community where you can learn just as much outside of the classroom as you can learn inside of it. And if you can think back four years, you can see where it all began. Freshman year, where we got our first taste of refectory food, RAs, and Father Roman. <laughs> At orientation, Roman assured us that we'd soon be a sharing and caring community in the great Benedictine tradition. And although, at the time, I thought he was trying to fit each of us with one of those black habits, he was right. It's surprising how quickly we all coalesced, considering how nervous most of us were this, the first week of school up here. I can remember hitting that off-ramp on 94 the first day and just wishing I could turn that boat around and go right back home again. And add to that the trauma of having to meet your first roommate. About a month before, we had all received a little postcard in the mail describing the name and address of our roommate. My roommate was supposed to be living on rural route one somewhere in Wilmar, Minnesota, which I had never heard of. You know, being a Chicago suburbanite, I'd never even actually heard of a rural route or met anyone who lived on one. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I figured, you know, in my ignorance that he'd be some red-headed, freckled country bumpkin who was tall and lanky, but I was wrong. Jeff, you, you weren't tall. <laughs> Within a week, though, we all became, we became fast friends, as all of us up on Tommy Four did, and all of us on all the freshman floors did. There, whether we liked it or not, or whether we knew it or not, our friends would help to shape us as subtly as the whole Benedictine atmosphere would during a whole four years. Of course, the faculty is also an integral part of our community. We've all had our favorite profs who've taught us, thing over, taught us things over the years that would influence, influence us for the rest of our lives. We also had profs who taught us a lot of things we didn't really care to know. But their job is finished with us today, for better or for worse, and we should all thank them for it. But there's one group who often gets left out of our community, non-intentionally, and that's the parents. Today, hopefully, they've been drawn, in or drawn into our community here at, the, at our commencement exercises and at the morning mass. Our parents sent us up here four years ago hoping we'd come out knowing something, except in my case where they hoped I'd learn how much I actually didn't know. But by you know, today we've all heard at least a dozen times from them how proud they are of us, and I think they actually mean it this time. And so, so hopefully we can work to make this day as special for them as they've made it for us. Finally, the sense of community doesn't stop today at our commencement exercises or the day we receive our diplomas in the mail, as we all 
know we will get them because we already have our official alumni St. John's card. <laughs> but, <laughs> We'll always be a part of St. John's because members of the community here, like Father Roman and Father Hillary, Father Brian, Father Don Telfus, and others, they've shown us that good guys can wear black. And throughout the course of the speech, throughout the course of the speech, if I haven't impressed upon you the importance of St. John's and our parents in our lives, I want you to just remember one thing. Your parents could have sent you to St. Thomas. Thank you. <laughs> Father David Burrell, the Congregation of the Holy Cross, is a professor of philosophy at the University of Notre Dame and chaired the Department of Theology at Notre Dame from 1971 to 1980. A specialist in philosophical theology, he received his BA from Notre Dame, his STL from the Gregorian University in Rome, and his PhD from Yale. He has taught philosophy and theology at Notre Dame for over 20 years and has studied and taught at various institutions of higher learning in Chicago, Bangladesh, and Jerusalem. Father Burrell has just received the University of Notre Dame's Faculty Award for 1986. He was careful to point out to me that this award is voted by the faculty of the university. I quote in part from the citation. The faculty award for outstanding service to the university goes this year to a priest who, in the troubled days of the Vietnam War, helped a whole generation of students turn anger and frustration to positive moral action. His 10 years as chairman of Notre Dame's largest and in many ways most complex department opened doors to a new understanding of theology's role at Notre Dame and in the church at large. The author of several books, his most recent work, Knowing the Unknowable God, traces the intellectual intermingling of Muslim, Jewish, and Christian traditions, which made possible the medieval synthesis that served as the basis for Western theology. I'm happy to present Father David Burrell to give the commencement address. Thank you, Father Hillary. When he told me that Garrison Keeler had given this address uh, last year, I want to say, how would you like to follow Garrison Keeler? But then all, all of you here who are from Minnesota will be above average, so you wouldn't feel threatened by that at all. You might even resonate with all of his humor. I must confess, some of it escapes me, but that I'm not Lutheran. Uh, but again, none of us, you or I, can on this day worry about following anyone else, older brother or sister, or even one parent or another. For it is your day, and in another way, your parents' day. Maybe some of you may know that priest, minister, rabbi story. Why does a rabbi always come off best in those, anyway? about when life begins, you know, the priest insisting that it begins with conception and the minister saying, yes, indeed, Father, that's the most logical viewpoint, but there are just so many contingencies and compassion demands that one consider life beginning at birth. And the rabbi is saying that he respected the priest's logic and the minister's compassion, but following the, the experiential theology of Abraham Joshua Heschel, he knew from just working with his congregation that life began the day the kids graduated from college and the dog died. <laughs> This is also, though we affect an air of detachment, your Mentor's Day. For those who have interacted with you these past four years as your teachers 
have invested something of themselves in you as they have grown a bit from such an exchange. The Catholic liturgy celebrates the Word of God taking flesh as an admirabile commercium, a wonderful exchange. And that is what the classroom becomes for those of us fortunate enough to be called to spend our lives in it. Yet our teaching, whether collegiate, secondary, or even elementary, will ever be beholden to that humane education whose primary locus remains the family. For it's there that we discover the worth of things, of one another, and of ourselves. Whatever we go on to make of what we have received there, however we improve our outfit, the fragile bark our parents launched with great fanfare ne nearly a quarter of a century ago, what makes each of us seaworthy, and what gives us both stability and direction, as keel and rudder do for a ship, is that sense of ourselves gained at home. And for most of us, in a home shaped by a larger community of sharing and of suffering, animated by the one who calls us not to be servants but to be friends of God, the master of the universe, he is that God, Father, Son, Spirit, whose presence to us we celebrate and marvel at today when the Church celebrates Trinity Sunday who bestows on each of us our most intimate worth and whose inmost life we have touched in the intimacy of our families. For each young man and woman here, taught to aspire to become an individual is at root triune, part of a trinity, mother and father and son or daughter. And it is that rock bottom fact which makes this day at once your day and your parents both at once. For to see each of you is to acknowledge the family which brought you here, and your brothers and sisters as well. So the challenge which I shall hold up to you today will not be something laid on you, but an imperative arising out of what you are and what you have become. For we are, each one of us, already related to others, and not merely the richer for it, but quite inconceivable without those relationships to our parents above all, to sisters, brothers, and to a wider sweep of family, to mentors, and as you have come to realize in a special way these last four years, and as the talk just before me illustrated so well, to our friends. Yet we are also, as men and women partaking of Western affluence, the poorer for our incapacity to think of ourselves in terms of those constituting relationships. The same educational system that has moved many of us above the average has also instilled in each of us the demand to go it alone, to stand on one's own two feet. That we thereby take responsibility for our own lives is of primary importance, for no one else can. That we have been taught to think of those lives as unrelated, however, and of ourselves as atomized individuals is nothing short of a betrayal. For such a mindset puts at us at odds with our own experience of friendship and of teamwork and alienates us from all that we really are and have become, as well as the true dynamics that have brought us to this point. Where do we derive so distorted a vision of ourselves and the selves we aspire to become? I have suggested the educational system, which otherwise has served us so well. The sources are deeper than that, of course, for that system effectively embodies the aspirations of the society it means to serve. It is that same society which finds it profitable to herd its teenagers into a lockstep conformity to genes, lingo, and beat, and which then demands that college transform this sweatshirted mass into self-motivated salesmen of success. But the transformation society desires is only clothes deep. For the mold is the same. You will be told what to wear to sell what you're told to sell. Our preeminence as a world power is predicated on an unquestioning army promoting our shiny product of individual success. Now what's wrong with that, some of you might ask me, and I need only direct your questions to those who've gained it. Success no one wants to knock, so why should I? 
Nothing succeeds like it. But on what terms? What is it that I want to succeed in doing or making besides money? And how am I to get there to accomplish it? What turns success into a bitch goddess, I would suggest, is the learned illusion that only I can pull it off, so that when it comes to me, it's my own. The ritual bow to my spouse only compounds the illusion, and men of today can only be grateful that fewer and fewer women will allow them that indulgence. But if success in those terms spells illusion, where does the reality lie? Again, ask those who have found it, despite the stereotypes strewn in their path. They will tell you that they have discovered success through partnership. Your parents will tell you that. And while your relationships and eventual family life will almost certainly have to adopt quite different patterns, the rhythm will be the same, bringing a shared vision to a common enterprise. What has made our country strong and helps also to account for its material success is our developed sense of sharing in a common enterprise. It was that constructive vision which in oceans removed from settled ways of privilege allowed the founders of this republic the space to create by a set of political arrangements designed to foster collaboration. Within that matrix, generations of immigrants found the right conditions and the right opportunities for development and so Minnesota was born. The language they adopted, however, the language of rights, was never quite up to the vision of partnership. That language itself, of course, was already compromised, if not undermined, by the stipulation that slaves be counted as three-fifths of a person. And that latent contradiction, that blatant gap between reality and aspiration took less than a century to break out into violence. How, moreover, the struggle of blacks to attain the parity subsequently assured by an amended constitution has been forced to continue through the subsequent century right into our own time. Dogged by the original physical and psychic stigma of slavery and saddled with the legacy of that original contradiction embodied in the basic law of the land, they have had to fight for what should rightfully belong to every American. What has been encouraging, however, has been the way in which countless other Americans made that battle their own, sensing that their own integrity was involved in the cause of blacks, that it was not a black cause but our cause, for the very meaning of this great experiment of ours hangs in the balance. Now our Catholic bishops are telling us that our integrity as Americans faithful to that original experiment hangs on our taking one step more from civil rights to economic rights, that our society should ensure that basic human needs of food, housing, health care, and education be met for all its citizens. They explicitly liken the challenge facing our society to that confronting the Founding Fathers insisting that the liberties embodied in the division of governmental powers and ensured by the Bill of Rights now be extended to include those conditions necessary for human beings to exercise that freedom. Why now? What is so strategic about this moment? Several factors are converging, economic, social, and political. Economically, we've long since begun to feel the effects of a closed frontier, when we could no longer simply expand into let yet more land preempted from the Native Americans who once roamed it freely. Our more recent integration into international markets for materials, goods, and labor has demonstrated all too clearly that we can no longer go it alone. Yet our position of power will inevitably lead to exploiting others unless it is consciously employed to promote interdependence. Finally, our yet more elemental interdependence with a delicate ecosystem continues to assert itself periodically, a kind of unpleasant specter for those of us brought up on a downstream mentality and the myth of an unlimited capital of resources. All of these factors conspire to remind us that laissez-faire will not do. And our history also tells us that our greatest success stories 
we're not really animated by that ideology either. For the social fabric that has long knit America together, presumed individual rights and liberties, but did not take its stand there. For it would require a more than mathematical wizard to take any number of non-interfering individuals and sum them up into a society. Bonding cannot happen automatically. It was perhaps inevitable that a public of philosophy officially agnostic about the human good would try to ground our civil rights in a freedom of non-interference. You don't get in my way, I won't get in yours. But the society which grew up around us and which nurtured us could never have been conceived or nourished on such non-nutritious fare. And the evident cracks and fissures in that social fabric today forcibly bring home to us how inadequate that accounting of human rights has been all along. And misleading as well, for what has really served as the bonding of our society are the distinctive sets of beliefs and ideals latent in ethnic communities and explicitly articulated in living religious faiths. These alone have given us the inspiration and the language we needed to make those sacrifices of our individual advantage which any social intercourse requires. Before presenting the political structure which our bishops propose to meet the challenge which faces us, it would be well to examine this social fabric a bit more closely, just a bit. It was, I believe, Oscar Wilde who remarked that socialism was a great idea, but there simply weren't enough evenings in the week for it. As, as our lives become more complex, juggling two careers and children's activities to boot, we become more and more jealous of the little personal space left to us. And careers themselves, it seems, have a way of becoming ever more demanding. We are all cognizant of the extent to which our American society was woven together by the imaginative contributions of voluntary service and how those volunteers discovered through that common service the very meaning of community. Yet the combination of factors I have just mentioned leaves so little time and energy for just that. Something has to give, but what? The message of our bishops eloquently corroborated by a research team led by Robert Bella at Berkeley, whose results have recently appeared under the title Habits of the Heart. They say is that what will give way is the carefully crafted fabric of the society we know and treasure, unless we can learn to think quite differently about our society and our role in it and begin to act accordingly. That's the step they urge upon us a step forward to assume the implications today of our great experiment, yet to do so by adopting a language richer than the original language of rights, at least in its individualistic interpretation, a language, in fact, more adequate to the animating forces which have formed us into the society that we know and appreciate. Now, we Americans have never thought that learning to think quite differently or adopting a new language or that sort of thing amounted to doing very much. Yet we will have to admit that every successful revolution was represented first by a revolution in thinking. And since the bishops portray the challenge facing us in terms explicitly extending our original revolution, we have best attend to what we are being asked to do. For the action asked of us will put us in a position to understand what they mean by economic rights and also offer us a constructive alternative to that somewhat misleading expression. Robert Bella and company put it quite starkly when they show, through extensive interviews, how Americans who try to live their lives by the standard philosophy of individualism display, in their words, a poverty as absolute as that of the poorest of nations. While at the same time, they insist, the practices of life that Americans are already engaged in embody a philosophy which they haven't the resources to articulate. As a result, the vision which has animated our society and which continues to do so in many families and communities cannot find expression in the truncated spectrum of present American political discourse. The result is a disastrous split between private interest and public good, which cuts through the psyche of modern Americans, tempting us more and more 
in the words of Robert Bella, to put ourselves in the hands of the manager and the expert. And it takes no great imagination to see that path leading right to the end of our great experiment with democracy. We do have, however, within our Jewish and Christian traditions, the resources to overcome and heal that split, and especially to do so in the revelation of God in Jesus as Father, Son, and Spirit. But first, the Hebrew Scriptures, whose pervasive concern with justice has been aptly formulated as a call to be faithful to the demands of our relationships. If we be already related to family, mentors, and friends, those relationships help to constitute us as the persons we are and have become. So they're not merely enriching as though we could somehow get along without these others in our lives. In fact, without them, we would not be who we are. So it's only natural that the very relationships which forge us as the unique persons each one of us has become would have demands attached to them. Again, not extra or laid on us, but part of what it means to be who we are. So being faithful to the self I have become simply means being faithful to the demands of these constituting relationships. And to call oneself a Jew or a Christian is to acknowledge that we are called to do just that, to be faithful to the demands of our relationships. If we were to think of ourselves that way, rather than as atomic individuals, each claiming the almighty right not to be interfered with, we would not need some more than mathematical wizard to sum us up into a society, for we would already recognize ourselves as knit into a fabric and begin to see a pattern emerging. And what makes the Christian distinctive, the faith we celebrate today in God as Father, Son, Spirit, reminds us yet more forcibly that coming into communion with others is not subsequent to existence, as one writer has put it. If God is related in God's inmost being and life, then being at all is being with, being is, being related. And what's more, our own, our own experience tells us that, not in so rarefied a language, but in the very practices of life in which we are already engaged, as Robert Bella's group noted so well in their narrative of interwoven interviews. So to begin to think in this way would only serve to bring our thinking in line with the best of our practice, our habits of thought in line with the habits of our hearts. And how would such habits of thought and heart articulate our bishop's challenge to us to take the next step in the great American experiment by recognizing the rights to life, food, clothing, shelter, rest, and medical care? If we thought of ourselves as already related to one another, we would accept without challenge the principle which leads the bishops to spell out these basic human needs as economic rights, namely, in their words, that justice demands the establishment of minimal levels of participation in the life of the human community for all persons. And since these fundamental personal rights to life, food, clothing, shelter, rest, and medical care state the minimal conditions for economic institutions, to guarantee that everyone participate at all in the life of the community, they are, in the bishop's words, as essential to human dignity as are the political and civil freedoms granted pride of place in the Bill of Rights of our Constitution. And to those who would object to the logic of the bishop's argument by staunchly defending freedom as non-interference, they retort that nothing will threaten the cause of freedom in the world more surely than the notion that political democracy and economic justice for the poor are incompatible. How could such a vision be implemented? What is its political import? By what has long been recognized as the genius of American enterprise and culture, a partnership born of the capacity for all to participate in the economic system, especially the poor, the disadvantaged, the handicapped, and the unemployed a partnership between government and those mediating structures which have shaped our participation in community, new forms of partnership between workers and managers in the face of competition in a world market, as well as innovative methods for increasing worker participation within firms. Each of these suggested political arrangements reflects the best of American populism 
as well as echoes longstanding catholic social teaching they must especially resonate among those here at st john's formed long ago by the thought and presence of father virgil michael for whom liturgical participation and economic participation were the practical complements of a catholic social vision perhaps most significantly however for you graduates of 1986 the language of the united states bishops is neither novel nor is it simply a way of speaking about the world today. For you, it must reflect something you've come to know and appreciate in your four years here at St. John's. For, for while you came not to a monastery, but to a college, while you came not for religious indoctrination, but for an education, you came nonetheless to a certain kind of college, to a very special place. And while you have learned many things here, the sense of direction which you have imbibed from spending four years learning in this place is inevitably stamped with that spirit of community which Benedict engendered and which generations of Benedictines have renewed in our midst. For the place itself, come alive through those who live and work in it, lay and religious alike, tells us from the early morning hours that we are already related one to another that we can only take responsibility for our own lives to the extent that we realize that they are already intertwined with those of others. Others enrich our lives, to be sure, but even more radically, they help to constitute who it is that we are and have formed us into the unique persons we have become. So for your part, you are already launched on a path responsive to the bishop's challenge. Yet like the rest of us, you carry in your psyches as well that peculiar Western schizophrenia separating private from public with all the consequent temptations to turn society over to the managers or the experts or even to become one of those yourselves. So like the rest of us, you need the explicit call of our bishops to work in whatever you anticipate doing for justice by being faithful to the demands of your relationships. And in your case, faithful to the trust of your families, as well as to the vision imparted in this sacred place. Welcome. Sister Emmanuel Renner is a graduate of the College of St. Benedict. She holds a master's degree in medieval history from the University of Minnesota and a doctorate in modern European history from the Catholic University of America. Her years at the College of St. Benedict include teaching and many administrative positions, including chairing the history department, dean of continuing education, Director of Planning and Program Development. For the past seven years, Sister Emmanuel has served as president of the College of St. Benedict. After a, after a sabbatical year, she will return to teaching. We are pleased to honor her today with the Pax Christi Award in recognition of the distinctive way that she has embodied Benedictine values in her life and work. Sister Eva Hooker will read the citation. We honor Sister Emmanuel Renner of the Order of St. Benedict today, not only because she has successfully woven together the many roles of college president, but primarily because in her relationship she has properly exercised that detachment, that obedience or hearing, which allows an institution to flower. Leadership, as scripture shows us, can be an exercise in detachment, the yoking of self to a way of life. 
The needs of an institution press with urgency and exactitude, demanding a conversatio and creative tension between the institution and the capacities of the self to act with prudent truth. The promise of leadership is peace, order, and fruitful action. It's promise to the individual an endless burden of obedience. The fine art of hearing what the institution says of itself, to itself, and to its public. This obedience, profoundly delicate and sensitive in character, requires of the leader continuous acts of inner and outer transformation. Colleges have founders and revolutionaries. They also have lawgivers and administrators, storytellers and historians. It is, however, as teacher of a way of life that still lives, as the student who exemplifies learning how to learn so that her defects as well as her virtues have inspired continuous reinterpretation, and as politician balancing conflicting values within herself, that Sister Emmanuel has made the sacrificial and transformative experience of leadership visible to our two academic communities. Her voice as a teacher of European history was silent so that her presidential voice might speak forcefully on the nature and future of the Catholic Liberal Arts College for Women. Her private role as a teacher of history was replaced by a public role which revealed herself, so that thereby the college community might reinterpret itself. Her much-loved work as interpreter of cultures yielded to the necessity to balance conflicting institutional values within herself so that the college might maturely relate its essential Catholic Benedictine character to the rapidly changing roles of women in contemporary society. Sister Emmanuel brought to the enormous task of the presidency an inquiring and gifted mind, a provocative and stubborn will, a heart willing to reveal its struggle to remain contemplative, wholly given to God within the busy confines of presidential life. The austere risk of public life as lived within herself transformed the college. She is, in the words of Marge Piercy, one of those people who harness themselves an ox to a heavy cart, who pull like water buffalo with massive patience who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who do what has to be done again and again, who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who stand in the line and haul in their places, who are not parlor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire be put out. The library is built, the raspberries are planted, the capital fund drive is complete. We, the St. John's community, salute you, Sister Emmanuel Renner, and wish you a joyous Sabbath, long walks in the sweet dawn air of Greece and Rome, and a happy return to our communities as historian teacher, lover of words, and the word. Because you have exemplified in your public and private lives as president, student, teacher, and politician, a leadership marked by your own character and luminous spirituality, St. John's University, Collegeville, Minnesota, in our 129th year, is pleased to present to you the Pax Christi Award.
I feel honored to receive this Pax Christi Award. One of the values I treasure is the cooperation between St. John's University and the College of St. Benedict. Together, we offer a strong academic program in a rich Benedictine environment. Thank you very much. From time to time, we have the pleasure of honoring alumni of St. John's, but it's uh, rare that that happens within 10 years of uh, graduation. Paul Shirky received a Bachelor of Science degree in the individualized major history of science from St. John's in 1977. He's currently a group leader for Wilderness Inquiry II a nonprofit Minneapolis-based corporation that organizes and conducts wilderness trips for disabled and able-bodied people. He is married and he has one child, an eight-month-old daughter, who recently welcomed him back from the North Pole. Paul was co-leader of the Steger International Polar Expedition, 500-mile, 56-day trek from Resolute Bay in the Northwest Territories to the North Pole this spring. The successful expedition was an extraordinary achievement and is scheduled to be featured in the September issue of the National Geographic magazine. Paul once characterized his experience at St. John's as one which imbued me with a strong sense of community service which is present in everything I do. We have invited him here today to congratulate him and to give him a presidential citation on the success of the Polar Expedition, of which he was co-leader and navigator. And this is the citation. Across the great polar ice cap, to the top of the spinning globe, where the sun stands at the same elevation through the day, you guided your teammates, aided only by the sextant and your skill in celestial navigation. Together with your companions, you put out to sea by dog sled and traversed the frozen ridges that roof the ocean depths. In a rare feat of physical endurance and a disciplined team effort, you displayed the power of mind and body and in the midst of a white and silent world, you discovered the infinity of the soul. For this triumphant venture, we salute you and confer on you, Paul D. Shirky, class of 1977, the St. John's University President's Citation on this 25th day of May, 1986. Paul. It's amazing, isn't it, how far you can go with a BA degree from St. John's? <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, deeply honored to have been invited here today, and I'm, I'm very moved by what you've given me, Father Hillary. Um, St. John's has been closely and lovingly linked with everything I've done since my graduation day in 1977. Uh, Wilderness Inquiry, our adventure program for people with disabilities, was conceived here on campus with myself and a fellow Johnny, Greg Lace, and Lynx Track winner travel our outdoor school up in Ely is tied in closely with the St. John's interim program. Uh, and my concerns in environmental and social issues were all nurtured here in the woods around Collegeville, so ultimately all this led to uh, my role in the polar journey. What we went through out on that ice is not really registered in my mind yet. It, it may never. Fortunately, your body forgets pain pretty quickly. 
Um, my diary says it was a miserable, excruciatingly difficult journey, but uh, it exists now only as a warm glow in my memory. What does register, though, what intrigues all of us on the team is the amount of interest and attention it uh, somehow generated among people literally all over the world. We're, we're not sure why it was neither the first nor the longest polar journey. Mind you, we received no information from the outside world on our, during our stay on the ice, so we were truly overwhelmed by the reception we received when we returned home. It seems that the interest may have had something to do, though, with the uh, string of hard news involving technological disasters that rocked the world during our absence. The uh, Space Shuttle Challenger, Chernobyl, the Titan rocket. Um, perhaps what captured imaginations uh, about our attempt at what it some deemed the impossible was the fact that uh, we did not rely on computerized guidance or uh, turbo prop propulsion or any other technological wizardry. Rather, what pushed us along most of the time was sheer determination and kind of the collective will of ourselves and our sled dogs. Ironically, the one book we happen to have with us was uh, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And as you know, the truth that rings through that book is that no matter what deprivations you are subjected to, you always have the freedom to choose your attitude in any set of circumstances. Frankly, there were many times out there when I was convinced we, we would not make it. My muscles, my mind said, no way. But we exercised that freedom. And sure enough, hope would find a way. Our spirits carried us through. So the brief message that I bring back from the North Pole and share with you today, particularly graduates, is to use your minds out there, wherever out there is for you, but let your spirits guide you. I'd like to close by reading with you the message that the eight, six of us have drafted and read at the North Pole regarding what the journey meant for us. It was read on uh, May 3rd, what, just under three weeks ago, four weeks ago now. It's a great day for us. We thank God we've arrived at the top of the world in good health and spirits. We are grateful to the 49 dogs who pulled so long and hard to get us here. They are the real heroes of this journey. And we are filled with thankfulness to the governments, companies, organizations, individuals who supported us through their donations, assistance, thoughts, and prayers. We felt you standing by us every step of the way. Our journey across the polar sea was filled with paradox. Surrounded by the gentle pastel beauty of the ice, snow, and low-lying Arctic sun, we endured the hardest work and most hostile conditions any of us have ever experienced. At times, there were tears of despair when obstacle after obstacle seemed to spell defeat. At times, we were overwhelmed by exhilaration as we made major breakthroughs. But most of the time, we just worked very hard, wrestling every inch of forward progress from the sea ice. We experienced pain, cold, hunger, and fatigue. For us, the significance of that is that we are now better able to empathize with people all over the world for whom these are daily experiences much of their life and who deserve the world's attention much more than we do. On a brighter note, this journey reaffirmed for us that hope springs eternal. In our moments of despair, we always found reason to persevere. As we six adventurers stand here at the point where the lines of longitude of all countries meet, we believe this journey stands for hope. Hope that other seemingly impossible goals can be reached by people everywhere. Thank you. the candidates for the degrees of Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Arts please rise. Father Hillary, I present the candidates for the degrees of Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Arts which have been approved by the faculty of the university. By virtue of the authority committed to me, I confer upon you the degrees of Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Arts, which have been approved by the faculty of the university and for which you have been recommended. The Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences will please have the candidates come forward. The 
The degree of Bachelor of Science summa cum laude is conferred upon Joseph John Barga and Stephen Patrick Garrity. The degree of Bachelor of Arts summa cum laude is conferred upon Stephen W. Moss and Stephen Wayne Reed. The degree of Bachelor of Science summa cum laude is conferred upon Jerome J. Albright, David John Brandhagen. The degree of Bachelor of Arts summa cum laude is conferred upon Stephen Jeffrey Falconer and Sherman Paul Merrick. The degree of Bachelor of Science Magna Cum Laude is conferred upon Jeffrey Lee Anderson, Charles John Breen, Aloysius John Klingelhutz, Charles Andrew McCormick, Thomas Joseph McEntee, Michael P. Murphy, Christopher John Sable, Jeffrey John Takala, James Jenkins Tyson. The degree of Bachelor of Arts Magna Cum Laude is conferred upon George Mark Alexander, Daniel Charles Gennard, Joseph Michael Guinea, Thomas Alexander Hughes, Charles William Johnson, Joseph H. Kalkman, John Francis Kelly, Douglas Dale Scott, and Michael Paul Zumwinkle. The degree of Bachelor of Science Cum Laude is conferred upon Mark Andrew Best, Blaine Anthony Brecht, William J. Eickhoff, and Lawrence Mallard LaFond. The degree of Bachelor of Arts Cum Laude is conferred upon John Raymond McNamee, Paul Mickey Nakasoni, William Anthony Ruff, Alan George Selinski, and Scott Edwin Tyson. The degree of Bachelor of Science is conferred upon the following. Joseph Peter Vaughn, Mark Joseph Hughes, Martin James Herman, David Rick Anderson, Chopper Henry Bitterman, John J. Ledoux, John Raymond Corsmo, Thomas Jerome Peller, James Nicholas Meyer, Timothy Edward Bott, Timothy William Martin, John Anthony Jude, Timothy Mark Lane, Stephen John Waletsko, Christopher Paul Setzer, Bruce Andrew Thielen, Daniel Patrick Malone, Kevin George Waldbilling, Bradley Richard Brown, Richard Mark Thompson, Frederick William Stein, John Frederick Weber, Jr., Bradley James Halberstadt, William Patrick Sheeda, James Everett Doyle, Stanley David Venny, Jr., Gerald Lee Keating, 
Jason James Merritt, Kevin Brian Kep, Michael Lewis Popovich, Michael Jerome Schmidt, Peter Daniel Schmidt, Peter Paul Spengler, Gregory Mark Dudziak, James Edward Janicek, John Carl Yeager, Alexander Michael Braylock, Michael Wayne Sullivan, Michael Andrew Horoshock, Greg Michael Hennan, Keith Donald Willard, Stephen Bennett Killian, Joseph Stephen Delwo, Todd Timothy Fritz, Mark Anthony, Mark Andrew Spaniel, excuse me, Paul Joseph Royer, David Francis Potter, John Leo Sullivan, Peter John Schomer, Thomas James Janey, Sean William Danahay, Brian James Werner, James Jude Crone, John Francis Grandellis, Stephen Martin Gallagher, Thomas Anthony Mahold, Michael James Quillen, James John Mazza, John Robert Jordan, Robert Thomas Fisher, Brett William Hagen, James Leo Getke, John Michael Mazzara, Paul William Trinan, John Allen Fred, Timothy Scherer Zitter, Christopher J. Benson, William Whitney Beeman, Jeffrey Allen Duzik, Theodore Patrick Baker, Mark Richard Duvier, Ben Martin Henschel, James Michael Lonetti, Michael Eric Raymert, Donald Michael Elskamp, Timothy Robert Tompkins, Dan Daniel John Torberg, John Gerald Whedon, Michael Anthony Haas, Mark James Griffin, John Stephen Couch, Joseph James Lane, Thomas Christopher Michon, William Joseph Coy, Guy Randall Hummel, John Charles Pachowski, Dante Carl Beretta, Thomas Gregory Morgan, Thomas John Kubinski, Paul David Brett, Paul David Brattensburg, excuse me, Brad William Miley, Thomas Allen Osbada, Osdaba, excuse me, Kurt, Kurt Peter Fritsch, Christopher Paul Turnquist, John Michael Allen, Todd Kermit Severson, Edward James Sear, Kevin Lee Osterbauer, Louis Arthur Hake, James Charles McGrory, Michael Anthony Hughes, Bradley Russell Nichols, Mark Peter Juba, Joseph James Kester, John Albert Janney, Jeffrey Allen Schroeder, Arthur John Rillo, Timothy John McNeil, Patrick Joseph Belisle, Robert Clinton Bogard, Jr., Michael Lawrence Olson, Richard Patrick Sudendorf, Dale James Marlowe, David Michael Nelson, Mark Ernest Munnings, John Michael Gogg, Michael Lawrence Hawkinson, Philip Bruce Grasick, Stephen Anthony White, Alan Ray Leastman, Scott William Houle, Stephen James Kenny, 
Ralph Malwitz, Todd Carlisle King, Todd Michael Ziesmer, Stephen Thomas Hickey, Bruce Howard Freidinger, Robert Henry Elan, Brian John Jacobson, Burke Alexander Williams, Michael Scott Erlinson, John Christopher Klein, Kemuel Levy Hepburn, David John Steichen, Joseph Franklin Garrett III, Robert Earl Stefani, Craig Gerard Uphoff, Stephen James Kane, Thomas Michael Shanehard, Peter John Franco, Michael Donald Eichler, Thomas Michael LaForce, Michael David Lentz, Kevin Mark Schnell, Yu Chung Francis Ung, Jean Autry Mackey, Wing Lock Ho, Shedrick S. Johnson, Basil Alexander Moss, Lyndon Ricardo Nairn, Stephen John Freshel, Jeffrey John Velch, Paul William Minor, Patrick George Minor, Gervais Sebastian Adderley, Robert, Robert Douglas Ziller, Mark Joseph Hawkins, Lloyd Samuel Sands, Paul Edward Holtorf, Joseph William Sockery, Joseph Scott Buck, Richard Joseph Mikos, Anthony Victor Bannock, Christopher W. Foley, Kevin Anthony Fitch, J Joseph Edmund Barra, John Francis McEwen, Stephen Patrick Morgan, William David Finley, Gregory Stephen Ross, Todd Bernard Brown, Thomas Anthony Leiden, Joseph Carl Hafliger, Scott Patrick Henry, Michael Winmanner, James Edward McGuire, Taylor Thomas Kilfoyle, Carl William Glander, David Thomas Kennedy, Patrick William Jolly, Jamie Irving Trusty, Alan James Stenzel, R. Frank Wiedner, Peter John Godich, John Paul McGee, Anthony Joseph Anderson, William James Lloyd, Michael Don Hutchinson, Oliver Edward Orth, Kirk Douglas Risberg, Patrick John Sauer, Robert Dennis Emke, Douglas Duane Bird, Gregory Richard Haig, Carl Christopher Fruth, Christian Joseph Weber, and James John Trobeck, Jr. The degree of Bachelor of Arts is conferred upon the following. Let me correct a, a bad mistake earlier. I'd like to present another candidate for the Bachelor of Arts, summa cum laude, John Robert Segner. And now the degrees of Bachelor of Arts. David Lawrence Hoban, Jeffrey Gerard Arman, Raymond Eugene Phillips, Joel Augustin Sherber, Patrick Talbot Niggerbacher, Mark Damian Gediman, 
Cameron Neal Smith, James Michael Reagan, Timothy ba Paul Hymans, Joseph Bernard Voigt, John Ambrose Stadelman, Gabriel Gerard Alchevsky, Darren John Davis, Michael Dominic Doyle, Michael John Schroeder, Stephen Thomas Capistrant, Patrick Brian Rooney, Joseph Murray Beatty, Theodore Joseph Collins, Scott Francis Anderson, Frederick DeWitt Banfield, Jr., Rogan John Flanagan, David Joseph Davis, Thomas Edward Fleming, Timothy John Welshans, Matthew L. Keller, Charles John Gross, Michael Joseph Cummers, Richard Lee Warzeka, Jeffrey Thomas Benning, Thomas Bernard Bastian, Christopher John Roth, Sean O'Reilly, Thomas Edward Halloran, Michael James Ryan, John Rosengren, Peter Lawrence Watkins, Carl William Stallman, James Michael Lesko, John Christopher Larson, Paul August Warlowski, Patrick John Walsh, Joseph William Sims, Felix August Manella, Jr., Socrates Bray, Terence Anthony Cunningham, David Allen Schuler, James Morris Merck, Mark Joseph De La Rosa, Patrick James Troska, John Kennedy Brudney, John Murray Steiner, Craig Christopher Jacques, Andrew James Kovacs, Daniel John Paul, Kenneth Gerald Odenthal, Keith Edward Heitzman, Andrew Paul Burris, Michael Joseph Maurer, Thomas Frank Marish, Stephen Gregory Fraley, Tom Stephen Reagan, Thomas Lauren Rich, Robert Chester Rule, Patrick Dennis Dwyer, Christopher Joseph Bowe, Mark Joseph Watts, Mark Thomas Burke, Thomas P. Lewandowski, Timothy Gerard Agar, Joseph William Kestel, Tim and Anthony Thurk, Timothy John Mahoney, Thomas Carlisle DeBates, Timothy F. Eddy, Michael Joseph Pillen, Thomas John Kiesner, David C. Caldwell, John Kerry Cadle, Martin James McAlpin, Michael John Schwab, Michael Joseph Wander, Joseph Charles Luer, David John Callis, Gregory Allen DeBrovner, Scott Gerard Collins, Vincent G. Kemp, David Clarence Stengel, Charles Edmund Claude, Robert Joseph Meyer, Wayne Call, Paul Paquin, excuse me, Brian Edward Reagan, Jeffrey Bruce Neeser, Richard Jonathan Unger, Gregory James Yorg, James Paul Marolt, Dennis Gregory Carlson, James Bradley McCourtney, Paul Anthony Cornelison, Paul William Necklin, 
James Francis Dwyer, Scott Thomas DeRocher, Timothy Christopher McGee, Kevin Arnold Roy, Brian John Nett, Matthew Allen Samuelson, Thomas Martin Hobday, Jeffrey George Cayley, Chris, Christian Thomas Hansen, David John DeMonso, Dennis Joseph Samala, Donald Paul Bartimus, Michael John Burns, David Norbert Pfefferly, Robert Charles Schofield, Timothy John O'Connor, Joseph Leo Cashman, Michael John Trombley, Greg Gerard Grinke, Richard John Cleary, Thomas Taylor Bennett, Stephen Edward Berner, Randall J. Martin, Gerard Edward Pettish, Thomas William Tuey, and Anthony Mark Pickler. Will the candidates for the, mass, for the degrees of Master of Divinity, Master of Arts, and Master of Theological Studies please rise. Father Hillary, I present the candidates for the degrees of Master of Divinity, Master of Arts, and Master of Theological Studies, which have been approved by the faculty of the university. By virtue of the authority committed to me, I confer upon you the degrees of Master of Divinity, Master of Arts, and Master of Theological Studies, which have been approved by the faculty of the university and for which you have been recommended. The Dean of the School of Theology will please have the candidates come forward. The degree of Master of Divinity is conferred upon Thomas Beckett Albin Franks, OSB. Margaret Julan Kramer, OSB. James Dale McClintock. Leo Mankadik. James Gregory Mormon, OSB, upon whom is also confirmed the MA in Theology with concentration in monastic studies. Ryan Thomas Perkins, OSB. Daniel Galindo Rascon.
Kevin Allen Sheehan. Llewellyn Joseph Trusca. And Christian Sebastian Wainwright. The degree of Master of Arts is conferred upon the following. Mary Florence DeMarco, Master of Arts in Religious Education. Jean Marie Ersfeld, SSND, Master of Arts in Theology with concentration in liturgy. Carol Marie Hemish, SSND, Master of Arts in Liturgical Studies. Sister Barbara Court, OSB, Master of Arts in Theology with concentration in monastic studies. Sister Ruth Ann Mathena, Master of Arts in Theology with concentration in monastic studies. F. Mtingiza, Master of Arts in Theology with concentration in systematics. <laughs> Warren Earl Peterson, Master of Arts in Liturgical Studies. Andrew Joseph Volkemer, OSB, Master of Arts in Religious Education. Sister Zita Wenker, OSB, Master of Arts in Theology with concentration in monastic studies. The degree of Master of Theological Studies is conferred upon Mary Lou Doomer, OSB.
Before the final prayer, I'd like to make this announcement. Due to the rain, the reception following this commencement will be held in the Great Hall. You may exit the church by using the west doors to your left as you leave church. The ushers will assist you from there. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of knowledge and love which you have made to dwell with us today. We thank you for these graduates, their parents, relatives, and friends. Favor them always with your love and wisdom as they seek your presence and will. You who live forever and ever.